you. Okay, so over to Stu. So he's going to be kind of delving into the megafauna that we once had in the UK and what we've lost and maybe the potential to bring some of it back. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so just a little confession really, like I was looking for a new hobby for New Year the other, a couple of years ago. <laughs> And it's turned out to be quite an expensive hobby. I was like, oh, everything I do is around nature. And that's, you know, that's, that's a good thing. So my hobby became collecting uh, fossils of extinct megafauna in the UK. Very geeky, but it's very cool. cool. And I brought a few uh, of my personal collection over there if you do want to look. But it took me on a journey thinking about, gosh, all these animals were actually here roaming the earth when people were roaming the earth. So although we're talking about natural history, we're actually talking about human history as well. And also, uh, some of the lessons we perhaps have not learned, we might be seeing again. Also, as well, just in terms of networking, guys, you can find me on LinkedIn if you want to stay connected after the conference. But the key thing is, when we talk about nature and the state of nature and biodiversity and so forth, it's really important to say that we're actually we're still learning. We're still learning about our own species and our own ancestors. And there's been lots in the news just in the, the last week or so, just about our own evolution, where we actually came from and so forth. So sometimes we can be quite ignorant with our knowledge of the natural world and uh, non-human animals when actually we're still learning about our own species. Just to start off, what is actually megafauna? So these are large animals of a particular region, habitat, or geological period. And to be considered megafauna, you're 45 kilos or over as an adult. So we have cheated in here. I do include the lynx, which gets to about 35 kilos. But I'm classing it anyway because it's a species we could potentially be returning. Also, we have our mega mammals as well. So they're species which are over 1,000 kilos in weight. And lots of these now are restricted to the ocean. And when we think of today's megafauna, although we're thinking about the UK today, actually, when we look around the world, megafauna is quite widespread, but it is sort of absent from the UK. There's not much in terms of megafauna in the UK anymore. And lots of megafauna, these big animals, often come into conflicts with people and the important thing about megafauna as well, especially the predators, they need access to a good prey source. So that's a key feature when we're thinking about megafauna, especially in terms of the predators. And again, these species are, are absent from the UK, but some examples of megafauna there are your crocodilians, your big cats, uh, larger shark species. Although with changing oceans and so on, a lot of scientists say we'll see more larger shark species in our waters and also polar bears as well. In terms of the herbivores, the herbivores seem to be more widespread. We're more tolerant of herbivores as a, as a species ourselves. We often think that they're less of a threat to us. There's not many scary stories about the big bag bison, or perhaps they, they should be. They're often more scary than some of the animals we think about, such as the grey wolf. And when we think about these large herbivores, these large megafauna herbivores, space is really important. These animals need lots and lots of food. At the moment, where they're restricted in certain zones, such as Africa, there's often lots of conflicts. So you might have heard of stories of elephants raiding farms and so on. So it's because the wild space has become restricted and the megafauna is running out of area. But if we're thinking about megafauna or herbivores in general, then it's really important that we think about predators as well. So if you think of the UK, we have a big deer issue at the moment and we lack anything other than humans actually controlling them deers. So I said in the UK we're sort of losing megafauna, we have a lack of megafauna and sort of we have an ecological boredom in the UK. It's like I love walking in the woods but sometimes I just think oh you know I'm probably doing British wildlife a disservice here but I'm like oh I wish you know it's a grey squirrel again it's not native. That's the only mammal I'm seeing often. So sometimes we suffer from a boredom where we might crave some of these species to return or get super excited when we do see them. But in terms of our land megafauna, red deer is our largest land mammal. So it's one of our two native deer, the red deer and the roe deer. Uh, but even the red deer is struggling in the UK. So in terms of body mass, it's 45% smaller than red deer on the continent because our red deers in the UK are often grazing rather than browsing because we have a distinct lack of forest in the UK. 
We also have some of our smaller deer species as well, uh, introduced species such as the muntjac deer, uh, and these are not really desirable with people who go culling deer or shooting deer for food. So these often go under the radar and can become a problem with biodiversity. But there's a distinct lack of other megafauna. We still have some amazing species, and some of them will be talked about today. But we have our badgers, the foxes, some exciting work with pine martins going on. The beavers are back, which is fantastic. And if you go to somewhere like Otterton Mill, uh, Steph, give a woo then for the beavers. Uh, if we go to places like Otter Otterton Mill, there's sort of a bit of an industry going there. The mill's thriving. A lot of the visitors are going to actually see these beavers. We also have otters and others as well. And lots of our small mammals are actually bouncing back in areas where there's protection. And I know if you get a chance to speak to Steve on, in his woodland, he's had lots of great finds of species sort of coming and using his land. The seas are a different story. Our seas are becoming healthy-ish. There's still lots of pressure on the seas and there's probably ticking time bombs there with contamination, plastic contamination, heavy metals and so on. But since we've started controlling fishing a bit better, and a bit is, is the key word there, and since we've stopped stuff like commercial whaling largely, and I know Cam will talk a, a little bit about the exceptions at the end of the day, but our seas are bouncing back a little bit. So we're seeing more megafauna return. We're even seeing species such as tuna returning to our coast. And these tuna are small in comparison to what they used to be, but they're bouncing back nonetheless. We're also seeing more fin whales. We often get fin whales now recorded every couple of years off Dartmouth, off Berryhead and so forth out to sea. Uh, orcas, we're having more visiting our shores, plus we've got that one resident population up in Scotland, which is a population that is probably only functionally extinct. It's not reproducing uh, largely because of the contaminants in it. And humpback whales, especially in the southwest, are coming back. So something positive is happening there. I always hold caution because we don't know if they're new whales or just new whales in a new area. Same with the tuna. We don't want to go, oh, let's go and catch those of tuna and put it in our local restaurants because they've probably just been displaced or moved because of the change in oceans. In the oceans as well, human impact is a big issue. We've solved some of the historic threats, whaling almost solved, but there's still lots of modern threats, especially in terms of contaminants, which we're just learning about. But there is good evidence of megafauna as well. So megafauna is in our history. It's not so long ago that these animals were roaming our lands. But there's lots of good records in terms of the fossil records. I know it's an expensive hobby. Uh, there's remains. We see more and more remains. Uh, cave paintings as well, depicting species, but depicting hunting. There's witness testimonies in our literature. And also, if we look at plant and tree evolution, it tells us that different things used to eat them. So I've got a woolly rhino tooth here. Feel free to pass it around. But if you look at this and compare it with a deer tooth, this tooth has really evolved to eat stuff like our hawthorn, our blackthorn, and so on. So the plants we have, when we're foraging for our slows and we cut our hands and think, why has it got a massive thorn on it like that? It's largely because of the evolution of species such as the woolly rhino. In terms of the causes of the loss of these species, there are sort of three main theories, and there is some overlap with these. And these are probably the theories that we live with today. So in terms of lesson learned, uh, we've not really learned much. Back in the day, we could argue actually this was a food source, a fuel source. Uh, woolly mammoth bones were used for houses. The, the hinds were used to keep people warm. So you could argue then there was probably a bit more of a excuse to uh, sort of take these animals where now we know lots about our natural world we know we're part of the ecosystem and we need to see ourselves part of uh, natural history as well but the three threats remain the same the climate disease spread and also modern humans as well out of these it's thought that modern humans is the most likely threat so if you take well if mammals some places in their range populations were dying, other populations which were isolated on islands but at the same temperature, at the same climate, lasted much longer because people couldn't get to them. So it sort of rules out the climate theory with certain populations. Also in disease threat, there's sort of no evolution of these historic diseases. We can't find them in isotopes, etc., etc. 
But one thing we do see a lot is hunting. We see lots of evidence of hunting of these species, and it sort of coincides with the spread of modern humans as well. So the last 50,000 years, modern humans have spread throughout the world, and also one thing humans have been really good at is adapting and using tools. Just look around the, the room here of all the things humans have created, from computers to water bottles, chairs, whiteboards, clothing, and so on. So we're a very adaptive species, and that can make us a dangerous species when it comes to tracking down species. And we see that in stuff like commercial fishing now, where we can take lots and lots and use fish finders and so on. We also scarily see it in the news in modern warfare as well. We sort of don't know when to stop our abilities from becoming too dangerous. Also as well, we sort of evolved our social structures. We became social primates. Fire brought us together. Feeding around the fire brought us together. It created language, so that cooperation was really there as well. Uh, cave art and remains of some weapons are around as well. And we have a fantastic site just down the road at um, Kent's Cavern as well, where lots of species and early humans included were found. There was also rapid climate change through these times as well. The climate has been changing, just not accelerated to what we've seen over the last 150 years especially. And this brings me to this statement. And uh, I say this probably a lot in my talks, but I make no apologies for it. And it brings us to this shifting baseline syndrome. And this is a syndrome that's a situation in which, over time, knowledge is lost about the state of natural world because people don't perceive changes that are actually taking place. In this way, people's perception of change are out of kilter with the actual changes taking place in the environment. And this is really important. So if you think... I always say to my students, oh, when I was a boy, I used to catch a bucket full of frogs in the stream. That stream's not there now. But if I go back to my dad and my granddad, they were catching two buckets, three buckets, and so on. But that's just in 50 years. We don't think 400 years ago. We don't think to the time when 75% of the country was actually woodland. There was tales about squirrels leaving the southwest of Scotland without touching the ground. So we don't often perceive things you know, which are more than a, a few decades out of kilter. And this is really worrying. One of my nightmares, one of the biggest fears I have, and I won't be here because I'm talking probably 200 years, is people stood where the Amazon used to be, looking out, going, oh, look at this beautiful moorland, a bit like we do on Dartmoor and places like that. Uh, there is potential for some of these species to return, though. And some of this lost megafauna does exist elsewhere. So we seem to have lost some of the more modern megafauna from the UK, but it's thriving elsewhere. Uh, for example, the brown bear there, which might be a difficult one to actually rewild in our country. But there are some key species that we could rewild, and these include species such as the bison. I've put a green flag there. That would be probably something that could be more widespread. Kent, I've released some bison there, the European bison. It's not actually the bison species we had. We had the steppe bison, and there's some, some bones over there. But that species has gone forever now. But in terms of the European bison, it's very similar. It's a species that could actually thrive it. And if you think places like Dartmoor are set up for it, the cattle grids are in place and so on, it's probably political and public persuasion what needs to take place. But in terms of infrastructure and the ecological needs, then it, it could be a possibility. I've put the links there in yellow. A species that could come back, we often see it as a scary big cat, but actually it's quite an elusive hunter. And then I put the grey wolf. Again, the grey wolf comes with a lot of heat and ate, if you think of everything from the little pigs to Red Riding Hood and so forth. And the grey wolf as well, it was a distinct subspecies that lived in the UK. So the grey wolf we have now is not the same, so it would never be the same one. Uh, in fact, the one that lived in the UK was more related to the Arctic wolf. But the grey wolf could thrive here. There's lots of prey for it. So here is the European bison, a great animal, uh, extinct in the UK, but it is the largest land mammal in Europe. And there have been some good rewilding attempts of this in countries such as Poland and so on. But in the 20th century, this species itself was close to extinction. So the fact that it's thriving and coming back elsewhere in Europe shows that we can make things happen and there can be a conservation success. Now there's over 8,000 of them and 6,000 of them in the wild. So there's some uh, ex-situ conservation, but also in-situ conservation is really leaving this. There's a great tourist potential with these. Just a show of hands, who would go out onto the moors to go and spot a bison if they were there? Yeah. 
you would probably buy a coffee in the local coffee shop, yeah. buy a bison tedder. There's a great potential there for it. And uh, they have a rut season like deer as well, so it's a great natural history event. And also, they're really good. They eat over 200 species of plants. So they're really good at shedding them seeds around an ecosystem. If you think of our sheep are quite selective. Uh, different breeds of sheep will eat different things. Uh, cattle will rip up all the plants and it can cause a bit of uh, damage on the ground, as these animals can, so it's all about stocking of these species if we do release them. But they're forest dwellers as well. That could be a problem in the UK because now we're only down to around 10% to 13% forest cover, but they are adaptable. So these bison are farmed in the UK. Uh, places like Wales, there's a nice bison farm there. In Dorset, there's a bison farm as well. So we know these animals can deal with the climate, can deal with the weather and so on, and live in a, a more pasture rather than a woodland. These species are great as well at maintaining a mixed landscape. And the more little things we have, the more mosaic of different habitats we have, the better it is for all species. Then we have the lynx. This species was lost 1,300 years ago. And it sort of has an unwelcome title of being one of the first species that was lost from multiple uh, negative impacts. And that's habitat loss and hunting. So it's almost double persecuted. Where the bison's bouncing back across the range, this animal has declined across its range. Even though the IUCN consider it stable, it still is a species that's sort of living on the edge a little bit. And that's because of persecution and loss of the animal. Uh, there have been some successful reintroductions. There's also been some unsuccessful reintroductions. So there's one in Portugal where they reintroduced two males and two lynx. So obviously that didn't go very far. <laughs> But these are small and elusive. I've been fortunate enough to go lynx trekking in Sweden and I never saw a lynx because they're so elusive. We found the footprint. Um, there can be conflicts with livestock as well, but it really depends on the farming systems. So lynx are ambush predators and they prefer to hunt in and around woodland. So if they're stuck in the middle of the field, it's very rare that these animals would risk coming out all the way to find it and the sheep and so on would also come across it. Elsewhere in Europe, there's con con compensation schemes in place to actually uh, compensate farmers if there is a loss, but some uh, claims seem to be inflated. So there's some schemes where farmers just say, yes, I've lost 300 sheep, give me the money, and it's like, okay, yeah, because we said it. Also, there's problems in Norway, and that's because they often graze their sheep in the forest, and that's where the lynx will actually hunt. But there is, I put this as an amber species because there's lots of progressive talk about releasing the Eurasian lynx in Northumberland, so in England, but on the Scottish border. And again, you need locals behind it, you need stakeholders behind it as well. But we also need to dispel some of the myths about this small, elusive cat. Then we have the cave bear as well. Uh, we have the ancestral cave bear and then the more modern cave bear. And this was quite a small bear, 1.5 metres at the shoulder. 2.7 meters long, 350 kilos, up to 500 kilos as well. The ancestral cave bear was lost much longer, but the cave bear itself, the modern cave bear, was about 25,000 years ago. There's been some recent research that suggests because this bear relied on vegetation, despite it looking quite menacing, uh, because of changes in vegetation and the nutritional quality of vegetation, it might have been that and its inability to adapt that caused this animal to be extinct. If you think of something like the brown bear now, very adaptive, we'll eat berries, we'll eat carrion, we'll hunt, we'll eat fish, we'll eat worms, and then you take the panda bear, which will pretty much eat bamboo, then if there's a problem with bamboo, that bear's going to go extinct quite quickly. Then we have the woolly mammoth. Cue the woolly mammoth tooth. So this is a specimen from the UK as well. So again, these animals, this is from a juvenile, used to just roam around and have a feel, go back into history through that fossil. So these used to be three metres tall at the shoulder, five to seven metres long, and up to 500 kilos. So these are big animals. These were lost around 10,000 years ago, so very recent. And there's some evidence of some populations only 4,000 years ago. So sheep and cows were domesticated around 8,000 years ago. So woolly mammoths were still on, on the earth. So these big megafauna roaming our lands. And these beasts as well, the woolly rhino, two metres at the shoulder, 
four meters long, 300 kilos, and these were lost 10,000 years ago. So very modern in terms of how the, the earth turns. Seems ages ago in a human life where we only think about 80 years. But these guys were here with our ancestors. Also cats. So you've probably heard of stuff like the cave lion, but we also had the scimitar tooth cat, which is quite a small cat, one meter at the shoulder, 1.7 meters long. 135 kilos, so the lynx gets to around 35 kilos. So if you think of that, it's not too much of a threat. And this species was a great hunter of the steppe or the plains and was lost only 10,000 years ago. So as people were domesticating cattle, this animal was going extinct. And also now, unfortunately, despite these species and sort of the conflict in knowledge about how they became extinct, we know now that we are living in a new age of extinction. So we know we're at a point where there's one in six species that are actually facing extinction in Britain. So Laura highlighted some of them. So it is sort of a biodiversity ticking time bomb. It's something that's happening on our watch. So I remember when I was doing my degree many years ago, I was doing a project on the Chinese alligator, which is my favorite species of all time, it's so unique, so wonderful. But while I was researching that, I come across the Beji or the Yangtze River dolphin, and it was as this dolphin become functionally extinct and then extinct, and I thought, God, if there's one thing people like, it's dolphins. Everyone loves a dolphin. So like, why is this animal becoming extinct? If we can't save a dolphin, how can we save a, a polar bear? How can we save something that might eat us and so forth? So I thought, oh, Dolphins gone extinct, and we're very close now to another marine mammal, the vaquita, but there's only about 10 left of them. So, you know, a quarter of this room is their population. And it's, again, it's happening. Five, five, so even five of them. So it's happening on our watch. So look to the four people next to you. You're the population of vaquitas. There's multiple drivers as well, and I think species are very adaptable. They can adapt to one or two things, but at the moment, they're getting hammered from all angles. They're getting hammered from disease. We've seen this with bird flu. They're getting hammered from habitat loss. We're losing habitat at a significant rate. They're still hunting pollution, not just the plastic pollution, but chemical pollution, light pollution, sound pollution, noise pollution. Uh, persecution, a lot of species, we decide whether they're vermin or they're cuddler. Uh, climate change, habitat fragmentation, and many, many, many other things are coming from our activities, the way we generally produce food, the way we generally produce our clothes, the way we generally produce our fuel. And also, under all of this, is the, the real big bad wolf is human-induced climate change. So it's something a lot of uh, politicians are still ignoring. And again, when we're talking 10,000 years, is nothing in nature five years in a political cycle is absolutely nothing. So perhaps radical change is needed to sort of address some of these issues. And I'm just going to finish on that point that, you know, I have a dream where people can get along and we can live better and in harmony with nature. And uh, you guys are the people who are going to go out and make a difference. So I thank you for that. And that's me done.